I was hoping to start out today with just a little bit of reflection because I I've, I've reflected quite a bit on the last four or five weeks. It's been um, this is this is really quite unusual what we're doing. <laughs> I don't know of any church in the entire United States is doing what we're doing <laughs> unless. Am I wrong, Greg? I, I'm not. I know other churches have done sermon series on the confessions. I don't know that any are doing them on length for length this year or in quite the quite the same way that we're doing it. Right. Um, this is full disclosure is that Damon picked which confessions we were going to use. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Uh, and I thought he did a masterful job of picking confessions. Oh, absolutely. Because if we'd gotten bogged down in the second Helvetic second or the Heidelberg Hel or the <laughs> Westminster, I don't think we would have had as much interest. He you know, he did the historic Nicene, he did the Scots to ground us in the Protestant Reformation, right. and then jumped to the 20th century, which I thought was a, actually a really wise decision. Yeah. And it has been, um, yeah. I think, meaningful. There's one that I still want to preach on, which is called the Belhar, oh, that right. we'll, we'll get to. Um, it won't be during Lent, but we'll get to it. And then uh, we may take this back up again yeah. and, and slog through the Hellenic <laughs> and the Heidelberg and the Westminster yeah. next year. We'll see. Yeah, and you're volunteering for that one. I'm volunteering you. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you don't know those confessions, those were very uh, very intellectually informed confessions that happened during the <clears throat> Reformation, and they they followed kind of a question and answer. At least Heidelberg and the Westminster does, and it, and it was a catechism that was you know you if you were going to be uh, in the Reformation, if you were going to be uh, part of the Protestant movement, you had to know what you were going to believe, and those confessions were uh, pretty long, you know, and pretty pretty extensive. Uh, but they follow, a, you know, a, a theological trajectory that uh, uh, that many of these confessions follow. That's kind of one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, today, and just how the theology of the most recent 20th century confessions uh, changes. I mean, it. it it doesn't change significantly, but I would say the starting point changes. Um, and we introduced that last week. But the thing that I wanted to ask, what have you been able to reflect on? I mean, have you done any reflecting during the week? Uh, is there something you, you've learned from the confessions? Uh, is there something that perhaps you said, uh, gee, I, I didn't know Presbyterians were, you know, thought about that, or I didn't know uh, this is there anything you know that I, I'm sorry you're not reflective during the week. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Um, first thing I wanted to ask, I'm assuming there's more than one book of confessions. Um, well, no. no for the for, for the, the Presbyterians, Presbyterians, it's just the one. So other denominations treat confessions differently than we do. What? We're we're the denomination that has. Is it, is there one that is revised? We we add to it. Yeah. So um, that, so then there would be more than one book if you add to it. Oh well, I see what you're saying. Oh. Interesting, you're asking that because your assignment for next week. <laughs> That's fine. There's going to be an assignment for next week. <laughs> um, you know, especially in light of these contemporary confessions that we're looking at, addressing issues that up until that point in 1967. Have it, had not been addressed in an institutional You know, that was 55, or was it? Yeah, yeah. 1967. Or 56, depending hard on that. Hard for me to do math in my head like that, but um, these these topics, these issues have not gone away. In fact, they've, they've gotten even more complex. And what I would like us to do is, you know, to pretend like we are a, a, a committee called to address some of the issues that these confessions have not addressed significantly enough for us. I have one particular issue uh, that is mentioned in one sentence. Greg knows what I'm talking about here in all the confessions of the church, but I think it's really very important. Uh, but, you know, we're not gonna actually sit down and write out a confession, but I would like to talk about aspects of what a new 2023 confession of faith might look like. Yeah. 
Uh, I think you'll get a really good sense when we look at the um, when we look at the Confession of 1967 and look at their paragraph on uh, on sexuality. And I'll I'll read that for you. Uh, Greg preached on uh, the contemporary that the what's known as C67, the Confession of 1967, last week, and the focus um, was on you know some of the the contemporary issues that were happening in 1967. And I, I introduced this last week by saying there was a, a shift in the uh, starting point of a lot of the confessions. If you read uh, the Nicene Creed, if you read uh, some of the statements where you're, you know, in the fourth century, people were trying to establish what they believed about God, what they believed about Jesus, what they believed about the Holy Spirit, what they believed about the church, all of those things, the starting point is, is God. But because of the theology of Karl Barth, who said that, you know, what we can know about God comes from one source, and that is the word of God, and that is Christ. And that being the case, that uh, influence of Karl Barth uh, finds its way into this confession of 1967. So you'll see and Greg will be talking about this this morning, uh, Paul has, was it, is, it, is it a benediction in 2 Corinthians 13? Yeah, it's the clo yeah. closing, closing yeah. chapter of 2 Corinthians 13, and, and it's, it, it's his blessing or benediction for the church in Corinth. And you might know it. it may, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Uh, the Confession of 1967 said, you know, that's really... You know, being influenced by Karl Barth, that's really the way we should look at things. Because if what we know about God comes through Christ, and if our salvation comes primarily through the reconciling work of Christ, then maybe we should organize our confession along those lines. Uh, so they did. And the focus being that ministry of reconciliation that we uh, talked about uh, as Christ reconciles the world to God, reconciles the sinful world to God through Christ's death and resurrection, so must the church, the body of Christ, act as a reconciling presence in the world. And boy, in 1967, they said, do we need it more than ever? And they have you know, four paragraphs in there that focused on what they believe to be the place where reconciliation was needed most. And, um, you know, I know it may seem kind of laborious, but I'm going to uh, read some of these. They, I've, I've kind of uh, taken out, uh, this is not the entire paragraph, but I've taken out the places where I think uh, we can um, uh, understand what they're, what they're trying to, to focus on here. The first had to do with racism. You might remember in 1967, right in the middle of the uh, civil rights movement, uh, we'd already had the, the, the march, the, well, just all the images coming out of um, out of the South, out of Alabama, Mississippi, names like Bull Connor. I remember that. I was I was six years old when this was going on, you know. But I remember the dogs, you know, uh, and the protests and this confusion I had about hearing that Martin Luther King was a non-violent person, but the protests seem to be so violent. Well, what I didn't get at six years old is the violence was coming from the other side, right? You know, with the, the fire hoses and things like that. And the Presbyterian Church at the time had the presence of mind to say, when you think about it, whose side is Jesus going to be on in that conflict? Jesus is going to be holding the fire hose, or is he going to be the one who's going to have his back thrown against the wall? Uh, you know, and uh, is Jesus a bold Connor, or is Jesus a Martin Luther King? And I think the church rightly said, you know, if we're going to follow the reconciling work of Christ, the place where reconciliation most needs to take place <laughs> might be in our. Um, you know, in, in our race relations. Now, this is interesting because it's complicated by the fact that at this time, and Greg, please help me because I don't know the Presbyterian history that well. 
there was a Northern Presbyterian Church and a Southern Presbyterian Church. The Northern Presbyterian Church was called the Presbyterian Church in the U.S. And then the Southern Presbyterian Church was called the United Presbyterian Church in the USA. We're going to talk about how they come together in 1989. 1983. 83, and then 1991 is when we get the new new confession, and they form the church that we now uh, are a part of, the Presbyterian Church USA. So we're talking now when we're talking about the, the confession of 1967. It's the Northern Church that we're talking about, is that right? Uh, but the Southern Church also adapted adopted it at their General Assembly after the Northern Church did. Interesting. This was one of the first. Uh, steps of reconciliation between the Northern and Southern Church was both of them adopting the Confession of 67, which is interesting. That is I mean, when you talk about a confession that's all about reconciliation, yeah. and that, that was the first step towards reconciliation that led to, led to reunification in 1983. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's layers upon layers here. Right. Did they yeah. split? When you, when you use the word just now, reunification, does that imply that at one point back in history? They in fact split in 1859. They okay. split right before the Civil War, oh, before the yeah, yeah, yeah. slavery, yeah. and the Southern Church uh, stayed the Southern Church until 1983. Yeah. The Northern Church, and wow. generally speaking, the Northern Church had an identity of being a bit more uh, liberal or progressive. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Southern Church had an identity of being a bit more conservative. Yeah, uh, there were exceptions to that certainly. Yeah, um, but by the 60s. There was already talk about reunification. Wow. It was only a hundred years <laughs> after the Civil War. Right, yeah. The right. thing, though, is like the history of the Civil War and the division of the United yep. States over the issue. It's the same thing with the churches. Yep. I mean, or and with there the were, church. That, and so you, 1859, you had a northern church and a southern church. Same time, you had westward expansion happening. And yeah. so uh, scattered gosh. throughout the United States, you have churches that were founded by the yeah. Southern Presbyterian uh -huh. Church and mm -hmm. churches that were founded by the Northern Presbyterian Church. This was a Northern church. Uh -huh. In Minden, there was both a Southern and a Northern oh, church. Oh. Oh. Yeah, really fascinating. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't, that's really neat to know because I, I, I had no idea. And the Presbyterians okay. actually were not really Western expansion oriented as much as like the Methodists. I mean, right. my gosh, they were putting people on do um, on mules and sending them <clears> off <throat> their Methodist oh. churches everywhere in the, you know, the 19th century. And we, yeah, we weren't unique to having this division oh. around the Civil War. Yeah. What's the largest <laughs> Protestant denomination in the United States today? Southern Baptist. Say it, say it louder. Southern Baptist. Why do you think they're called the Southern Baptists? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. And they have they reconciled? Or no, they haven't reconciled. No, they're still the Southern Baptists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And there are yes. Baptists. Well, but that, that's a good question. This is one here. American Baptist. Yeah. That that's was not the church a Southern that Baptist. split off yeah. from the Southern Baptists. Yeah. Go ahead, Will. Where want? was the United Church of Christ in all this? Because there were a number of UCC churches here. Leading the, the way. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> Leading the way. The, 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 <laughs> I'm, pro I'm progress. Yeah. The, the, the UCC right on church. Congregationalists. <laughs> yes. The Congregationalists, well, first of all, yeah. they have a very congregational quality, so each congregation yeah. does its own yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. the church in Hastings may not agree with what the church yeah. in Harbor is doing, may not agree with what the church in Grand Island is doing, and they're allowed to have that disagreement. Yeah. Yeah. The church in Cambridge, where I grew up. But yeah. <laughs> at a national level, at their national denomination, the UCC has always been on the leading edge of uh, these reconciliation movements. Yeah. They were on the leading edge of racial reconciliation. They started doing that work in the 40s. We didn't come around to it in the Northern Church until the 50s and the Southern Church until the 60s. The UCC was out ahead of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very interesting. Yeah, my father pastored in Aurora and it was Presbyterian, UCC, and Congregational called the Federated Church. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was relatively progressive. The Gaynos Sandersons all came from that church huh. here. Wow. Well, I, I just thought we'd read read this, and uh, it, and it really is pretty pretty progressive for the time, 1967. Um, God created the peoples of the earth to be one universal family. Now, in His reconciling love, this is I want to point out that the language here, because when we look at the the brief confession. The whole issue of talking about God as male versus no, no female metaphors uh, is going to come come to the fore. You know, so this is progressive, but some of these progressive issues that we know today have not 
you know, been introduced just yet. So it makes me feel, and perhaps all of you, if you're used to using uh, inclusive language, it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable even to read it as it was stated. But God created the peoples of the earth to be one universal family and his reconciling love. He overcomes the barriers between brothers and breaks down every, no mention of sisters, no. of course, yeah, <laughs> and breaks down every form of discrimination based on racial or ethnic difference, real or imaginary. Therefore, the church labors for the abolition of all racial discrimination and ministers to those uh, injured by it. Congregations, individuals, or groups of Christians who exclude, dominate, patronize their fellow, or patronize their fellow men, however subtly resist the spirit of God and bring contempt upon the faith which they profess. Uh, this is still very relevant for us today because there are movements afoot uh, that have whole theologies around them that do not see people uh, who are not Caucasian as having been created in the image of God. Uh, this, this has never left us, unfortunately. And just as the Nazis tried to co-opt, you know, the German uh, evangelical church in, in the 1930s and, and into the 40s, so, you know, neo-Nazi movements are trying to co-opt Christian, uh, Christian symbolism, Christian theology to uh, establish uh, their legitimacy. And in this context, of course, we can just look at this statement and say, no, you know, from 1967, we have a confer affirmed that this is contrary to the theology of the church. This is contrary to what we find revealed to us in the reconciling work of Jesus Christ. Jesus worked among, well, think about the issue with the, the, the Good Samaritan, uh, the, the, the story told about the Good Samaritan, or the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, these were outcasts, right? And Jesus asked, actually not only sits at the well with this woman, but asks her to give him something to drink. If you know about Jews at the time, you know, there, there was a real, very strong emphasis on ritual purity and not being close to those who are going to make you ritually impure. Jesus overcomes that barrier in the Samaritan story. And so based on something similar to that, based on, you know, the various, various uh, uh, references in scripture where reconciling work is done among the races, uh, the 1967 confession can say very clearly that this is part of who we are. Um, any thoughts about that? Greg, you preached on this, so please let me know if I'm not no, you're, you're good. Picking up. Um, we mentioned this last time because I've, I've got a lot of um, lot to get through today. The, the church did make a statement about, um, I think, inherent in this or implied in this, there is a uh, rejection of nationalism. Christian nationalism for that purpose, uh, for that mistake, uh, for that, no, I don't know what I'm trying to say, Christian nationalism, this idea that somehow the way of the nation and the way of Christ are wed. Uh, and certainly we see a lot of that. We saw that during the Barbie Declaration. There are some people who just said, absolutely, yes, I'm going to go with the, I'm going to go with the way that uh, Hitler has laid out for us. And this is utter idolatry. And there was this very, you know, uh, uh, controversial statement in this uh, in this paragraph. Uh, reconciliation ha ha has to happen among the nations. This requires the nations to pursue fresh and responsible relations across every line of conflict, even at the risk of national security. Now, that created some problems, right? Even at the risk of national security. Draw the line when it comes to following the reconciling work of Christ, the word of God, or the, <laughs> the work of the nation, which often can be in conflict with the work of Christ. Which, which side are you on? That old coal mining song. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? And the church laid down 
especially in the context where biological and chemical weapons and nuclear weapons were being created, the church has to be on the side of peace. Yeah. And one, I think that we know... Dan, I yeah, want to say that, that last one was controversial enough that it required a uh, memo from the Department of Defense mm -hmm. right. saying that Presbyterians could, in fact, serve in the armed services mm -hmm. and still be Presbyterian mm -hmm. because there was a question raised, and the Secretary of Defense at the time was a Presbyterian who yeah. opposed this language. Robert, and there, was, there. Yeah, there right. was a question yeah. raised yeah. of, can Presbyterians ascribe to this confession mm -hmm. and still serve our country, or are they a national security risk? And there was actually this a memo drafted that said, yes, they can ascribe to this confession and still serve in the military. Who raised the question? Uh, well, it was raised by McNamara himself. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but also, <laughs> and, and so the, the, the question was, does that paragraph make yeah. us a pacifist church? That was basically the question. Yeah. And the response was no. Yeah. There is still room in here for engaging in acts of war mm -hmm. in extreme circumstances, and therefore this does not make us a pacifist mm -hmm. church, and therefore Presbyterians who ascribe to the Confession of 67 can still yeah. serve yeah. in the military and are not a national security risk. But this was like, this was in the press. Yeah. And so, you can imagine, yeah. I mean, well, well, so yeah. how do you... Uh, I have good friends who serve in the military as conscientious objectors, and they and they were they came out of religious traditions. I don't know if I, I don't know the designation about pacifist church. What that means, I don't know if that's what the churches that they came out of Quakers were called. Quakers would be yeah, yeah I, I assume, but they they didn't they were not they could have served they would have chosen to serve as other than conscientious subjectors that's a personal choice that they could have how, how do we how at the time how do we today deny people because of an organization they're in without giving them the opportunity to make their own decision about what what they believe and whether they're willing to serve so or think, not yeah think back to the 1960s and jfk being the first catholic president and the questions about his loyalties were his loyalties going to be to the pope in rome or were his loyalties going to be to serve in the country right it's a very similar conversation now that was resolved and jfk was elected president and we dealt with the catholic it was, president it was resolved by the voters it wasn't resolved in any other correct mm -hmm. but then but then nobody took him to the supreme court and said you can't be president because you're roman catholic and so it's a very similar line of thought to this and the uniqueness of Presbyterians being, in this sense, a confessional church, that is unique. Quakers don't have confessions that they ascribe to in that same way. And so they just wanted clarity that if this confession is passed and Presbyterians agree with this confession, does that limit Presbyterians' ability to participate in the military? And that was how it was, it was resolved that no, it does not. So. Go ahead, Will. Well, and I was paying attention to Greg on Tuesday noon and you followed, uh, this is my note, we try really, really hard for peace, but we're not officially pacifist. Correct. Is that a fair summary? That's of fair. And, and almost every General Assembly, there is a motion brought to the General Assembly to make the Presbyterian Church a pacifist church, and it never passes. Yeah. Yeah. That, we would, we, that we would oppose war in all circumstances. And it's, it's brought almost every mm -hmm. year. Yeah. And it's often not even, often doesn't even make for the floor for debate. It's because often, it's too absolute, uh, absolutist, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, even, even Bonhoeffer himself. Yeah, was, right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. But, but there are, there are Presbyterians who believe mm -hmm. that war is never just. Right. And every year they mm -hmm. bring a resolution. <clears throat> it rarely makes it out of mm -hmm. committee. When it does, it gets on the floor and is obviously voted down. Well, for example, I, I've, would probably fall closer to that camp than many people would. But, you know, I look at what's happening in Ukraine. I look at the aggression of, of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of Russia against innocent of Ukrainian people. And I, I ask myself, there's got to be something that can be done, you know. Uh, this is just utter destruction, you know, for all for this glorious past of yeah. Russia. Um, and this would be a situation where I, I would have to, you know, really wrestle with, okay, if, if I were put in that situation, would I, you know, yeah. go to war? Um, and that wrestling goes all the way back through the history of the church. Aquinas yeah, wrote yeah. at length about what wasn't at the time called just war theory, but functionally the, 
foundation of just war theory is based upon Aquinas's writings. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Aquinas's writings, which, by the way, follow the same type of uh, structure as the Helvetic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. He, he asks questions and then he answers the questions. And this is something called the Summa Theologica. Uh, but it's a really easy way to, to follow it. It's based on Aristotelian uh, logic, really, you know, question, answer, question, answer down the line. But the whole just war theory, yeah, as Greg's saying, since the 13th century, if not before. Um, here's one I think that we all can you know, understand pretty clearly. At the time uh, that this was written in the United States, one out of every five people in the United States uh, was living in poverty. Um, and this was all a part of the civil rights movement as well. It wasn't just about racial discrimination, but economic discrimination. Um, and LBJ had his, uh, was it 1964, the, the yep. civil rights legislation uh, that, that came out of a lot of, the, of this turmoil. And the church wanted to affirm that as well. Uh, the reconciliation of man through Christ, there's that reconciliation again. You no, know, and think about this. If there's true reconciliation, I used to do this, by the way, with my students in class. Um, uh, I would bring in like 24 donuts. Would there be maybe 10 people in the class? And I'd take about nine of those people and give them two donuts and give 22 donuts to, to one person, right? Chow down, everybody. Have a good time which kind of represents where we are with our one percenters, right? One percent of the people in the world control more than 50 percent of the gross domestic product or the wealth of the world. That's, I think the, the, the ratio may even be higher than that. I'm just drawing that from the last thing that I've heard. But, you know, there's an obscenity to that, really, uh, to just having so much and sitting back while people starve. Mm. And I think as a church, and I think we do a very good job of this here at uh, First Presbyterian, we want to address those inequities. Uh, the reconciliation of humans through Jesus Christ makes it plain that enslaving poverty in a world of abundance is an intolerable violation of God's good creation. Because Jesus identified himself with the needy and exploited, the cause of the world's poor is the cause of his disciples, i.e. us, the church. A church that is indifferent to poverty or evades responsibility in economic affairs or is open to one social class only or expect, and this one's great, expects gratitude for its beneficence, makes, it a mock, makes a mockery of reconciliation and offers no acceptable worship to God. Um, I, I can't get any clearer than that. And I, I think when we look to uh, Jesus of Nazareth and the work that he does, and this is going to be very important for uh, the next confession, the brief statement we look at. Uh, I think you're going to talk about this in your sermon today. The, we don't really see in a lot of these previous confessions a lot about the work and the ministry of Christ, you know. But if you look at the Apostles' Creed, you know, it was, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. Skips yeah, 33 years there, right? Yeah. Born of the Virgin Mary yeah. and suffered under Pontius Pilate. There's right. 33 years of life and ministry there that is overlooked. Yeah, and it's very, doc it's very doctrinal stuff. We want to make sure that we're, we're talking about the virgin birth. We want to make sure we're talking about the crucifixion, right? Well, what about the ministry? You know, it's it's not there. And this, this 1967 is moving us toward that. Uh, but when we get to the brief confession of faith, uh, and I've written it out, and we'll probably have a little time to talk about it next week, too. All of it is clearly laid out. This is what we do. This is what we affirm in terms of the work. Uh, and at the core of a lot of it is this alleviation of, of poverty. Um, Greg, do you want to speak to some of the mission? Uh, I mean, you worked in the... Uh, well, I'll speak locally to this church. Uh, this church studied the Confession of 67. So they, they started drafting in the late 50s. And it was uh, more than 10,000 requests for study materials were received right. <laughs> at the national denomination. So churches were studying this, including this church. Mm -hmm. And 
and out of it, and if you go back and look in our archives, we started doing more poverty work in our community in the 1960s at First Press Hastings, including starting the Go and Serve program, mm -hmm. which was an attempt to address both poverty and also if you look at some of the places that Go and Serve has gone, particularly in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, racial reconciliation. We went to places where there was still strong yeah. division and still a need for that. I and went, we sent teams there. I went to Ozone, Tennessee in 67, oh, yeah. I think. There, there it is. Yeah. Peter Lainson went to Ozone, Tennessee in 67. Yeah. That was the second year of uh, going through. That's right, yeah. And, uh, and so this church responded to this confession by doubling down on its work um, uh, in this area. And, and Cy Kessler himself yeah. served on the Salvation Army Board. Uh, because that was the, the group in town that was doing poverty alleviation work in the 70s. And, um, you know, that's an interesting thing to me. Salvation Army is a church. To have a pastor of this church serving on the board of another church is a fascinating concept to me. Mm -hmm. But that was part of Sai's legacy was ensuring that we were doing poverty alleviation work. And in that case, we were doing it vis-a-vis -vis the Salvation Army, which was appropriate at the time. Um, and since then, this church has continued to, to build up its work towards addressing this issue of poverty in our mm -hmm. community. We do it at a national and international level as a church as well, uh, particularly internationally, which is where I work was in World Mission. Much of our global mission force is doing poverty alleviation work in the name of Jesus Christ and in the name of reconciliation. So we have folks who are doing agricultural development, educational development, medical all addressing root causes of poverty in the name of Christ. So when we talk about mission, we're not talking about just evangelization, yeah. which I think when yeah. people hear that, you're going out and handing out pamphlets and things like that. I, I think many churches, when they have a mission project, one of the main things they want to do is go out and convert souls. Mm -hmm. uh, but could, could I just say yeah, one thing to follow up on what, and Greg knows what I'm going to say. <laughs> they say that so well. But the first go and serve was, I remember, 1966, mm -hmm. and Jenny and I were sponsors mm -hmm. with the associate pastors. And we, racial and poverty, we went to South Chicago, mm -hmm. Seventh Presbyterian, Seven. which is <laughs> Seventh. Wow. We're and so that's, original in our name. Yeah. <laughs> that's the first Presbyterian church. There's the second, the third, the fourth. But that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the near south, and it's probably some. I'm sure it's still there. Mm -hmm. But we didn't go walking around in the neighborhood. Yeah. We slept yeah. in the basement, and we taught Bible school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we went to the Chicago Symphony, so go figure yeah. out. Was it was that uh, Dwayne Queen and and uh, no, it was Gary and Jeanette Thompson. Okay, and we rode the train in the Chicago. Okay, I vaguely remember that. And then the, yeah. the second uh, class or whatever you want to call it was was me and Chrisman and S Susan McClellan and uh, Joni Kerr yeah. and all these kids going to Ozone, Tennessee. Right, I remember and there was Las that. Vegas, New Mexico, that Jenny and I did. Oh. Uh, which is working with, with indigenous populations. Yeah, again, with, uh, with race and Ron modern. Pango and um, Bowen. And then neither one is here. We're still in touch with, oh, what's her first name? Bowen. But anyway, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah so there so, you go. So you may have run into Michelle uh, Robinson Obama. Who was growing up on the south side yeah. of Chicago? And, right. And oh, wow. it's, right. it's very interesting reading her biography, autobiography, oh, reading about yeah, yeah, about yeah. what about what it was like in the south oh, side right. of Chicago. I can't remember. She she might not have been born then. I can't remember exactly how she, she would have been born in the late '60s. Oh, yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but but she at '66, her yeah. her neighborhood was a transitional neighborhood that there were whites and Italians and blacks. And over the time that she was growing up, it pretty much transitioned into being a black neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I sometimes wish she would run for president. I, mean, <laughs> I know she's not, a, but you know, but she's such a, uh, a person that you would want people to emulate the way uh -huh. I, I, see, uh -huh. I see her. So, but, um, well, that, that is, you know, certainly a part of the history of this church and, 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 probably, and we're not alone in that as well. Um, when we get, you might remember that this number here, 946, 
it refers to sections. This is the ninth confession in the Book of Confessions, and we're looking at paragraph 46 that that uh, or section 46 that that works with um, with poverty. Here's one I thought I would like to. I don't under, Frankly, I don't. I don't understand what they're getting at with this, and I thought I'd read it with you, and maybe y'all can <laughs> enlighten me. I think I do, but it just doesn't seem to uh, end up in a place that's just like, yes, I know what you just said, mm -hmm. right? So this is about sexuality, and you might remember in 1967, a lot of things were happening. You know, you had the uh, uh, birth control pill, which is now becoming available, giving women uh, uh, the freedom in many ways uh, to to be a little bit more uh, uh, autonomous with their sexuality, you might say. Um, you had the free love movement, which is you know, going to reach its apogee, and uh, and uh, uh, what are we talking about? Woodstock, sixty-nine, right? <laughs> Wood, uh, Woodstock in nineteen sixty-nine, right? Um, and then you know all of all of this, the hippie movement, all those things. The end of the What's that? No, no, I'm just I said you were blushing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was a 10 year old kid. Come on. Yeah. Now. <laughs> no, well, but now you're blushing. Yeah. I remember in Life magazine, you know, we got that it, uh, <laughs> that magazine at our house. I remember looking at pictures of you know, kids playing in the mud and all this kind of I stuff. Know. They looked like old people to me. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know. <laughs> But let's let's read this. It's 947. Yeah, for a neighbor. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the relationship between man and woman exemplifies in a basic way God's ordering of the interpersonal life for which he created mankind. Anarchy in sexual relationships is a symptom of man's alienation from God, his neighbor, and himself. Right, let's let's wow. parse that word anarchy. Yeah. But what what are we getting at here? I, I think, trying to think about, and, and keep in mind, they started drafting this in the late 50s. Yeah. And it was a 10-year yeah. process of drafting before it was adopted in 67. I think even today there's some relevance to this because anarchy would be sex outside of a committed covenant relationship. Yeah. That, that's how I read it. Yeah. And, and I think that's still true today. I think sexual relations outside of a committed covenant relationship are a symptom of alienation from God. Do you think that's Please the way say that. back then? I'm not sure that I would say it is. What, what do you think they meant by you know, free love? Free love. And, and, well, and, but that's sex outside that's what of he a just, committed covenant relationship. I don't think, think it necessarily is. I think it maybe is probably more likely back then sex outside of marriage. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, yes. Yeah, and, and that's the language that would be used in 1967 is sex outside of marriage. I'm, I'm. It's different than what you're saying. Yes. How? I'd be curious. Committed covenant relationship is living in sin for a long time. Okay. Okay. It's not being married. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, but my I, question I, is, and, what? And, committed, and same I'm sex, sorry. same sex relationship. Committed really covenant weird. relationship is marriage is a committed covenant relationship. It is yeah. one. It is one form of committed covenant relationship. Are there other forms? Well, that's that's <laughs> that's, that's, what say is, is one that's what Chuck is getting at. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, 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 but your but, word was that's one form, so that yeah, it begs the question. Okay, what's another one? Well, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to like you know indict you. I'm just curious. I'm, I'm yeah. generally genuinely curious. Well, the hand fast ceremony that people do, you know, that recognize in community that I am making a covenant with my partner to be true and to be loyal right. and faithful and all of that within this community. Uh, but it's not necessessarily recognized by right. the church the state or right. the church. And, yeah. 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 And, and, and I think that, I think there are instances where, um, not getting married for folks who have been widowed or oh. divorced for a long time and are older adults, Right. And marriage yeah. would mess up retirements uh -huh. or benefits. Uh -huh. They choose to live in a committed covenant relationship okay. that looks a lot like a marriage to me. <clears throat> yeah. Whether or not they've actually signed a marriage license. Done the certificate. Okay. Okay. So my my question in this is why why use such an amb 
or a term fraught with all kinds of baggage anarchy, you know? uh, and why not come out and say that we believe that the covenanted relationship between a man and woman uh, married and recognized by the church and the state, something along those lines. It just seems to me that their ambiguity is trying to, to I leave it open to interpretation, but uh -huh. in so doing, not making it clear enough. Or my theory on this, this is just my theory. I was not alive in the 60s, so I can't speak to this, <laughs> um, was that so much of the rest of the statement leaned into what were termed liberal politics of the day, that this was a nod to the conservatives. This was how you loop in the conservatives to buy into the confession of 67, Interesting. was oh. give them their point. Their point was they're very concerned about sexual anarchy. Let's go ahead and cede that to them, and we'll include that in this document so that they then buy into our points yeah. about poverty, about race, about... Yeah. And I legitimately, having worked in the national denomination and watched how these types of statements are put together, really? I yeah. think there's a very decent chance that that was what yeah. this yeah. paragraph That's represented. That's really insightful and yeah. helpful yeah, for me. It, it is. Uh, in other words, Reconciliation, yeah. a conciliatory well, a statement. form of reconciliation to pull in the conservatives yeah. to say, we're, we're hearing you. This is what you're concerned about right now. Yeah. And so we're going to name it in this confession in the same way we're naming these, these other concerns that we're concerned about right now. And do you think this right. idea of anarchy was, was actually this, vocabulary that was yours or is it this one? Yeah. Okay. Right. Was that language that was being used by, by the conservatives. Yes. Oh, yes. You think that was being yeah. used? Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Sure. I just wanted to say that I think um, <clears throat> we're a person today to speak those words and choose those words and um, have those words to say a thing that that would be different than a, a person doing the same thing back when it was written. Because I think that the use of words the choice of words and how people use words, mm -hmm. even though they're the same words, yeah. is different today than it was then. Oh, I don't know. So I think that is completely, I don't, I'm not going to say loaded, but I, I think that there's a lot there. Um, well, back to, your, yeah. back to your, your starting point, the, the homework that you're going to give us. This is the one so far that is so, so much farther away yeah. from where we would start today talking about all of the issues that yeah. you've raised so far in, in yeah. these. Now, it, it does get... Uh, I mean, the emphasis the on one thing and I, women. Yeah, there is no mention of... of uh, Same-sex relationships. Right. And, and and women aren't really mentioned in 1967. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, there are some, some implications, but this whole idea... Well, first of all, women were already by this time serving in churches, if I'm not mistaken. They could be they could be ordained at this time. So in, right? Yes, in both the northern. northern and southern church had agreed to that. Yeah, it was not happening in practice yeah. in the southern church. Yeah, it was 1958 or 59 that the first woman was ordained in the northern church. The southern church had, but it was not happening in practice, and there ended up being a case that went all the way to the church's highest court. Yeah. That basically forced a presbytery to accept women in ministry because the presbytery was resisting despite it having happened. And I think in the, the next confession, the brief confession that we're going to look at, here's what that banner looks like. Uh, there seems to be a recognition of some oversight and then the, 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 that, that women probably were not uh, discussed significantly enough in the 1967 confession. So it will it will eventually be amended, you might say. But let me move on and, and see what you think about this language. Um, man's perennial confusion about the meaning of sex has been aggravated in our day by the availability of new means of birth control and the treatment of infection by the pressures of urbanization, by the exploitation of sexual symbols and mass communication, and by world overpopulation. The church as a household of God is called to lead men, again, lead people out of this alienation into the responsible freedom of the new life in Christ. Reconciled to God, each person has joy in and respect for his own humanity and that of other persons. 
A man and a woman are enabled to marry, to commit themselves to a mutually shared life, and respond to each other in sensitive and lifelong concern. Parents receive the grace to care for children and love and to nurture their individuality. Then the concluding sentence here, the church comes under the judgment of God and invites rejection by man when it fails to lead men and women into the full meaning of life together or withholds the compassion of Christ from those caught in the moral confusion of our time. That's, wow. That's interesting. We, we want to lead people, men and women, into an understanding of the full meaning of life together, uh, but also not withhold compassion from those who are caught in the moral confusion of our time. Um, for, for a person who really wants to know what they're getting at, I, I find this way too vague, and I, and I don't know what the reason for the ambiguity is, I, but uh, it doesn't seem to uh, address very, very specific issues like the, the poverty issue, you know. Uh, and I don't know what the reason was for was that. Um, but at the time, conservative Christians were very concerned about the availability of birth control yeah. and even the availability to treat STDs <clears throat> because that would mm -hmm. oh, yeah. allow people yeah. to be more promiscuous. Mm -hmm. So all the barriers that have kept people from from promiscuity yes. have, are being, are, have are been working. lifted. Yeah. And the yeah. conservative church was very concerned about that. And so, and, and it, to go as specific as to name accessibility to birth control and treatment of STDs yeah. Yeah. Uh, tells you that they were clearly drafting from a, a particular perspective, right. this paragraph. Yeah, yeah. So uh, remember your assignment for, uh, I don't know if you all have the Book of Confessions, and are they available in our library, Greg? Uh, there's a copy available. I need yeah. to order more. Yeah. Because actually all the copies we have to don't include the bell hard either. It's at, and actually there, if you ever want to really get into it, this this study edition is really fantastic. It gives good history uh, behind how the confessions were created. Oh, yeah. well, you got some, somewhere to go? <laughs> I'm not preaching on that paragraph today. I was barely going to get out. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We, we, may have, we may have lost over that paragraph in my sermon last week. And we're really the next yeah. Well, but our, our task for next week is to, to think about, you know, how we might create a confession that's going to be relevant. What are the main topics that need to be addressed by the church, and, and how should we address those? Uh, Chuck, you're already pointing out that this was, yeah. you know, uh, the issue of same-sex relationships yeah. doesn't even it doesn't even yeah. cross the uh, you know people's uh, radar at this time. In 1967, uh, I don't know when was when was the Stonewall riot? Was it 1969? I mean, even then, I mean, yeah. very 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 below the radar of where people uh, were. But we've come quite a ways in 50 or more years. Um, let's then look at the result of, and I only have a few minutes, but when we come back, I do, this is a wonderful brief statement that um, it's just a little bit longer than the Apostles' Creed, but you can almost memorize it if you had to. I remember, you know, you, when you get older, you start thinking back on some of your memories of your childhood, and there's one woman by the name of Mrs. Workman I don't know if, I, I can't remember if I've mentioned this before, but in my fourth grade Presbyterian uh, Sunday school class, she had us memorize the Apostles' Creed. And to this day, you know, I can memorize mm -hmm. the, the Apostles' Creed. Um, and, you know, Mrs. Workman, I don't know whatever happened to her. I'm, I'm sure she died, you know, 10 years within, when the time that I knew her. But, you know, what a gift to offer to somebody. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I think about it every time I say that creed, you know, uh, but this brief statement of faith is kind of along the same lines as the Apostles' Creed, except it is written, um, it's contemporaneous with our issues. It was, well, the General Assembly that I think I'm telling you now that the North and the South, those churches came together in 1983, 
But it was by 1991 that one of the things they wanted to do is say, okay, let's let's make sure we know what we believe. You know, we've been apart for 100 years. Let's make it clear what we believe and what we can all agree upon. So they put a committee together, and this committee came up with uh, the statement over about 10 years' time, eight years' time. It comes before the General Assembly of 1990, and you know how these things work. The General Assembly votes on it, and then they send it to each of the presbyteries, all the presbyteries around the United States, you know, the regional uh, governing bodies, of the churches, and then the, the sessions of the various churches that belong to the presbytery vote on the statement, and then it's sent back to the next General Assembly, and they ratify it, or they you know, adopt it. And this was adopted in 1991. And one of the things they wanted to make sure that they did is to acknowledge their Reformed heritage. Uh, very important because, you know, in, in the modern era, some of the ideas of the Reformation uh, were starting to, you know, take second place to more, more ideas that came out of the Enlightenment. But Reformed heritage basically says, that focuses on something known as the sovereignty to God. In life and death, I know that my life belongs to God. That's part of the Westminster Confession. Uh, that God has, uh, that God's love is, is pervasive throughout the world, through creation, through all humanity, <clears throat> and that God has a plan. God's will is working its way out in the world. Thus, God is sovereign over all. That was the number one concern. But they also wanted to make sure that they were going, I should also mention, part of the Reformed faith is this idea that when it comes to salvation, uh, we are saved by grace through faith, and thus we are justified before God. Uh, it is by nothing that we do, we don't come to God and say, look, hey, here's all my good works. Am I in? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, but rather, even while we were yet sinners, as Paul says, God was reconciling the world through Christ. That it's through God's grace that we are able to come before God. It doesn't mean we're sinless. It, do, it doesn't mean we're sinless, but that sin is, is covered over. We put on Christ, so to speak, uh, through the death and resurrection of Christ. Born again, we hear that a lot from evangelicals. Where does that fit? Uh, well, this idea of born again would be an act of what's called sanctification. It's a good question. Uh, a lot of times, in, this, in the United States, we have this sense of pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps, you yeah. know, yeah. and we get, we are able yeah. to enjoy the fruits of our, our labors if we work hard. That carries over into our understanding of theology, but it's absolutely wrong. Right, <laughs> There's yeah. great conflict between our economic philosophy and our, uh, our theology. This idea that I can work hard and that at the end of, you know, I can come before God and say, look, I've done all these great things. Reformed theology turns that around and says, we are uh, loved by God even before our birth. God loves the world and wants the world to be reconciled to, to him. Um, and thus, through our belief in Christ, we can be justified before God. As a result of that justification, we live lives of sanctification. In other words, we do holy acts. We do acts of that are um, uh, that are are sacred. We, we care for the poor. We, we feed the, uh, the hungry. We, we visit you know, the, the prisoner in, in prison. We do all of these things, not because we want there to be a reward at the end, but we've been given the reward, and our acts of sanctification are like a thank you note. You know, I didn't deserve that. Wow. I need to we hear it today, pay it forward, right? Yeah. So, sanctif so born again, it really comes from the realization that you're part of a covenant community, you've been baptized in that community, uh, you have been accepted through Christ in your baptism, and thus you must 
live out you know that that realization through your lives in the world very different from what we know in a american culture where <clears throat> Where it's all what they call it uh, um, rugged individualism. Yeah, rugged individualism, or um, oh, there's another name for it that, that I'm trying to think of that I can't think of. It's right not now. like manifest destiny or something. Yeah. Well, yes, well, there's yeah, more of that. that. Yeah. 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 Um, but I'm thinking of uh, you know I've I've got all the degrees and everything, and therefore I'm entitled to to you know to be the smartest person or to be the best, you know, <laughs> yeah. entitlement kind of thing. Um, we don't have to work to get the salvation. We are encouraged and, uh, uh, yeah, encouraged to work doing these, these acts of, of kindness and sanctified acts as a result of our understanding that we have been accepted, mm -hmm. saved despite all of our uh, all of our sinfulness, you know, that's another part of the Reformed tradition is that human beings uh, have a natural tendency to look out for their own best interests first instead of the interests of others. We call it sin. I, some of these words, I wish we could come up with new ideas because so much baggage, bag, baggage goes along with it. But it's basically the idea that I'm I'm the most important person, right? Mm -hmm. And how can we help but not be ego-centered the way that yeah. you know, the first two years of our lives, <laughs> you know, our parents are taking care of us like, hey, I'm the only you know, yeah. person here. Uh, but when we don't put that egocentrism away, that is what we call the sinfulness of, the, um, of humanity. Uh, so in sanctification, we try also to put that sinfulness aside. When we look at this brief statement of faith, you will see very clearly that they want to emphasize the sovereignty of God. They want to emphasize the uh, centrality of, of the work, reconciling work of Christ. They also want to do something that wasn't present in 1967 and talk very specifically about women in ministry about the role that, that we are all created in the image of God. Men, male and female, he created them. Uh, and thus, women hold as much uh, entitlement to uh, ministry as men do. This is contrary to what we hear about in the Scots Confession and the Second Helvetic Confession from the Reformed Era. <coughs> Basically, they come out and say women can't preach, women can't do anything at church, you know, so we've come a long way. Uh, but what we're going to find when we come back next time, this attention to Jesus' ministry, that spot that the Apostles' Creed does not mention, you know, the horn of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate. Well, the brief statement of faith develops that 30-year period of time uh, in Jesus' life as a model for our uh, life as well. Uh, I've gone over that rather quickly, but what you'll see when we come back next time, uh, there are uh, some statements here we'll go through. We'll just go through them. I know there's a lot of text there, and I know a good PowerPoint doesn't usually involve a lot of text, but it's it's good to go through it and just kind of point by point and see where we are. Any questions? Remember your assignment. Go ahead. I don't think that I... The church that I was raised in was a UCC congregational church. I don't remember ever hearing about the Reformed heritage. I don't know if I know what that means. What? What? And so my question is, tell me what churches or what denominations are Reformed and what aren't. Because we spend a lot of time talking about yeah. how special we are because we're Reformed. But yeah. if it goes back to the Reformation, is yeah. everybody that's not a Catholic yeah. uh, part of the Reformed tradition? Yeah. Or are Orthodox? Part of the reform tradition. I mean, I, just, I don't know what it means. All right, what it means is, uh, in the 16th century, there there was a Reformation. People like Martin Luther and John Calvin, uh, you know, wanted to see the Catholic Church reform because of certain what they saw to be mistakes that they were making, mistakes about sacraments. But the big mistake was this idea that you could somehow pray your way into heaven. Do so many Hail Marys, do so many, you know, uh, or and, and take the Eucharist, uh, all of this. You had to have the church as your mediator between you and God. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you could get straight 
to God. You know, you had to do all the things that the church required. Of you. So that's what everybody believes. It's not a Catholic. I well, I don't want to say everybody, but, 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 but traditionally that everybody has been everybody that believes. Yeah, believes, yeah, believes. that that is that has been the uh, the orientation. So what's so special about being a part of the Reformed heritage? Well, made, that makes us different than anybody else that doesn't go to the Catholic Church. Um, one of the things is this idea of a this the, the priesthood of all believers that we have a direct relationship to God and that we are all priests. So we we are all called to do these things. Greg is no different than anybody else in terms of his uh, ability to be led by the Holy Spirit to work in the world. So you are a priest. You know, everyone in here is a priest on the same level as Greg. And so if you look at that little section in our the bulletin that says the head of the church, Jesus yeah. Christ, the ministers, the congregation, the pastor is, is you know, Greg. So that's part of the, the, the heritage. But this idea of, of justified by grace through faith, that is about as reformed as you can get. That, that we recognize our sinfulness. We are born into sin, original sin. Apart from the grace of God, we can do nothing. This is all from Paul's letters. We can do nothing that is of salvific quality. Let's put it that way. That it is through God's, through the work of the Holy Spirit that we do the work of God in the world. We can, it's far more complex than this. <laughs> but, um, but the other thing is, is that looking at the church as the body of Christ and we, the members, as the priests in that body of Christ, working in the world, that's, that's about as reformed as it gets. And you can see that becomes a foundation of later political thinking about democracy. So the Reformation is going to be that step that is going to take the 200 years later is going to develop into hmm. democratic, you know, thinking democratically. If we're all priests and we're all, you know, citizens and we have equal, you know, you can see how that would develop. But we're at our at our time, so I, I'll, I'll yeah. conclude. But maybe when we come back next time, I'll I'll do a little primer on what makes us reform. So. How many more years are we doing this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, really, really. John Calvin is the person yeah. who's kind of our main guy. So, but let's let's close close in prayer. Gracious God, we're thankful for the opportunity at this special time of the year to come together and speak and speak openly speak in reconciling ways with each other recognize that we are all priests doing the work of the body of the body of christ and doing the work of christ we ask that your spirit be with us as we go to worship and that you be with us throughout the week in jesus name amen